Welcome back to Before the Day Ends. We are on episode six. Now we've covered in our previous episodes looking at the Gospel of Matthew, the Bible in general, a little bit about our perspective on when we read the Bible. We talked a little bit about the history of the period that Matthew was written in and refers to, the period of Jesus in the New Testament. But today we're going to get a little more fine-tuned on the Gospel itself and take a look at the Gospel of Matthew. Now, to do this, let's take a look at the title itself. It's called The Gospel of Matthew. Well, what's a gospel? Well, first off, it's primarily a report of victory from a battlefield. So this was literally good news. And in this case, it's the good news that God's kingdom is now coming to earth. Like God is going to show up, that his kingdom, his reign, his rule will now be on the earth itself. And we'll see this occur again and again and again in the Gospel of Matthew, including the Lord's Prayer, right? We say, your kingdom come, your will be done. And that's going to be the good news of what Matthew's talking about. Second, it's the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to get his perspective on the story of Jesus. Now, remember, there are four Gospels. And, and one question you might be asking is, why are there four and not just one? Why not combine them all into one document? Well, that was tried. It was called the Diatessaron. And the early church rejected it and said, no, we really don't want that. Instead, what we want to have is the different perspectives. And the difference is what we see between a picture, a photograph, and a painting, for example. If you take a photograph of something, you see what it is. And I, I know there's some artistic license to photography, but just hang with me here for a second. A photo is a representation of what you see. But a painting allows for more interpretation from the artist itself. Or the, you know, the way the painting is done, the colors that are used, the way the shapes are done, the technique that is used, all adds a layer of interpretation. And so the artist brings him or herself into the painting and how they're seeing it um, and what they see about that image in the background. Look here at an example. This is called the Christus Pantocrator. And as you look at this picture, actually this painting, sorry, you'll see that you have an icon of Jesus. And this is a very, very familiar one. This one dates um, from the very early period. Um, and Saint, in fact, I saw this one at St. Catherine's Monastery. So if you notice, there's two halves. On one half, Jesus has this open hand and a hand of blessing. His eyes a little bit more bright. It's the side of grace. The other side, the eye is darker. He's holding a book. It's the book of judgment. So in Jesus, you see these two halves. This artist has communicated Jesus is full of grace, but also brings judgment. And then these two images, these two truths are captured in this one painting. And so there's something we can learn from the, how the artist saw Jesus in the way he painted Jesus. Well, the Gospels do the same thing. We've got four Gospels, each giving different perspectives on how they see Jesus. And each of those teach us something a little bit different. Now, since this Gospel of Matthew is written, there are some literary tools we can look at looking at this Gospel as well. Matthew was brilliant in the way he wrote in order to make the Gospel memorable. He used connection points for his Jewish audience. So he wanted to use things that were connected with a Jewish audience so that they can make it easy to memorize, that they can carry this with them. There weren't a lot of written copies floating around, so when you heard the gospel, you wanted to hold on to it. And so he used familiar elements to put on new images, new truths. So imagine he had a coat hanger. He could hang different coats on this coat hanger that they were familiar with. And one of the biggest ones is going to be the fact of that Jesus is bringing the new Torah, the new instructions. We'll get to that in a minute. Now, before the Gospel of Matthew was written... It was handed down orally. They told the stories of Jesus. 
Now, why did they not write him down right away? Well, remember that Jesus said that he'd be back soon, very soon. And so they were kind of thinking, well, he'd be back really quickly. We'll just tell his stories. But as time went on, that surety that he'd be back soon and what soon actually meant began to shift and change. By the 60s and 70s AD, we begin to see some pressure on Christians living in the land, living in Jerusalem, living in Judea. We see pressure financially, pressure religiously, and they begin to move away and move, move out of town. And then by the destruction of the, of the temple in Jerusalem and the destruction of Jerusalem in 70, people are fleeing and they're leaving the area. And so they began to write down these stories so they can carry them with them. And in case Jesus is delayed, they want to make sure they can hand on what the apostles taught, what the disciples taught, and hand on those stories. So again, with the temple destruction, um, we think Matthew's written probably between 70, maybe 90 AD, somewhere in there. Um, the Gospel of Matthew is actually cited itself by 110 AD by Ignatius, the Bishop of Antioch. So we know somewhere in that period this gospel, gospel was written down. So how did this happen? Well, we know we had the oral stories that Matthew is using, but we also had some written stories too. And one of the theories that we have was that Matthew had access to at least Mark. And what we call this is the four source theory. In fact, Matthew reproduces about 90% of Mark, and a lot of it's verbatim. Um, so this four-source theory is really based on what's called Markan priority, that Mark came first. So you look at this chart, we have Mark that feeds into Matthew, and then also feeds into Luke. And then you have material called Q, and, and Q is just uh, the German word for source. And what it means is, that there were this material that's common to Matthew and Luke. So maybe in this document we call Q. It doesn't exist, it's just a theory. And then there's material that Matthew had, just for Matthew, and material that Luke had, just for Luke. So, but Mark, it seems, came first, and many believe that Mark was the stories of Peter, that Mark just wrote down the stories as Peter told them. And, in fact, in Mark's gospel, the word immediately is used a lot, like he's just telling these stories over and over again, in rapid succession, rather. So um, Matthew, it seems, has access then to Mark. Something else Matthew does, which is really neat, is that he uses literary markers. So there's a what we call a ring device in Matthew. It begins and ends with the same message. It begins with the message of Jesus being called Emmanuel, which means God with us, right? It ends with Jesus leaving, saying to his disciples, but I'll be with you always to the very end of the age, Matthew 28. So it begins and ends with this message that God is with us. His kingdom is, in fact, present. Now, there are also many um, outlines for the Gospel of Matthew, and, and we can go through all of them. It, it really, I want to focus, though, on one. One that I believe... Um, I think communicates what Matthew is trying to do. It will also help us better remember the Gospel of Matthew. Remember that in Matthew's day, there weren't chapters and verse numbers. So they had to have a way to hold on to where things were located and what way they could remember these things. So one of the big connections that um, Matthew makes with Jesus is that with Moses. He wants to focus on Moses. Moses was the one who brought Torah. Jesus will bring New Torah. Moses is the one who brought the people out of slavery and made them a nation. Jesus is going to take people out of the slavery of sin and make them a new people, a new nation, if you will. So in a way, Jesus is the new Moses. And so Moses becomes this reoccurring theme. We'll see it again and again in the life of Jesus. So for the gospel, though, the way it goes together is he's going to use the five books of the Torah, right? So we had Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Those five books create the Torah. And if you go to a synagogue or a temple, you'll see them. They'll have those big scrolls. Those scrolls contain those first five books, the Torah. And Jesus will create this new Torah. So Matthew's gospel is divided into five sections. And they're, they're marked by these verses here. Um, 728, 11, 1, 13, 53, 19, 1, and 26, 1. Now, you think it's kind of weird places to break these texts up. Remember that the verses came later. 
So this was a perfect place for Matthew to break it. We just added the verses kind of in the wrong spot, if you will. Okay, so let's take a look now at this chart. And this is one you probably, I'm gonna put on our online as well as a PDF. But you'll notice that if you look here on, on the left column, it's got the chapter numbers, generally. Chapters one through four are the birth and beginnings. So this is the first story section. I call it a narrative. It's just the story of Jesus' birth and beginnings. Then, chapters 5 through 7 is what's called the renewed Torah. And what he does now is he kind of gives his new law. It's the first discourse. That pairing, a narrative and a discourse, make one section. It goes on. Chapters 8 and 9, we have a story of the works and wonders of Jesus, followed by a discourse on discipleship in chapter 10. And again, you notice that the verse numbers are in parentheses next to this for the actual sections that are marked by uh, literary markers in Matthew. And, and those literary markers um, are become quite obvious when it's something like, when Jesus finished saying these things, it is a typical ending to one of these uh, discourse sections. It goes on. So then our third book is chapters 11 and 12 on opposition to Jesus, and then followed by Jesus teaching with parables in chapter 13. 14 through 17, his predictions and some miracles, followed by his um, talking about life and community in chapter 18. And the fifth book, 19 through 23, his Judean ministry and narratives, followed by 24 and 25, him talking about the coming kingdom. And those are the first five books. And that all ends with chapters 26 through 28, which we call the passion or the death and resurrection of Jesus. So if you notice then that these, and these books go together, we'll talk more about this later, but in that first book, for example, um, Matthew 1 through 4 and then 5 through 7, they kind of go together. They're the beginning of things. And we'll talk then, for example, in 8 and 9, his works and wonders, we'll see a powerful connection of Moses there, but also that what it means to be a disciple and how that fits into these works and wonders that Jesus is doing. So you're going to see how it's kind of go together. It'll also help you later on to identify where things are. Like when you think, where's the parable of the sower, for example? Well, you can look at that um, in chapter 13, which is kind of in the middle. And so we'll begin to put this stuff together. And I want you to keep this kind of outline um, available to you as you read through Matthew. And again, it'll help you, one, just kind of put things in context, but also help you locate things in the future. All right, so next time we'll get together, we'll actually jump into the Gospel of Matthew. I uh, hope this was helpful. Hope you have a great day, and we'll talk to you next time. Mm -hmm.